Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's session and career talk with Dean Apseso. I just give it a few minutes to uh, let everyone join. Meanwhile, I'll introduce myself. My name is Hiba Abbasi, and on behalf of the University of Manchester Middle East Center team, I would like to welcome you all and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Today, it is my pleasure, and we're very delighted to have with us today, Dina Psiso. Dina is a motivational speaker, and she's the founder of Challenge to Change. Dina is a passionate advocate for the empowerment of Arab women. She built a career in private banking over 25 years, having worked as a senior executive with leading international banks in Geneva, Switzerland. In 2014, Dina launched Challenge to Change, a Swiss nonprofit association focusing on Arab women empowerment. It is now recognized as the region's leading platform for women, offering life-changing programs that equip them with confidence and the skills needed to achieve their full potential. Challenge to Change has empowered over 10,000 Arab women since inception. She's also a motivational public speaker and has spoken at various prominent forums on the topics of inspiration, what women empowerment and mental wellness. Among them were the Arab Power uh, Women uh, Power Summit, the largest congregation of prominent MENA women held in Bahrain in 2019. The executive woman held at the Holy Spirit University uh, in Lebanon in 2018 and the Royal Charity Organization in Bahrain. She is also a member of the Toastmasters International in Bahrain and has secured first place in recent competitions at the club and area levels. Dina earned, earned a BA bachelor's degree in political science and economics from Duke University, and later on an MSc with honors in foreign services from Georgetown University. In her spare time, she writes poetry and paints. Dina loves alpine skiing, reading, music, and the outdoors. She is the mother of two adult children and spends her time between Bahrain and Geneva and travels extensively. Dina, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. We're really honored to have you. Um, I would like Thank to you, begin. Heba. The honor and the pleasure are mine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're really, you know, today um, it's about your career story. So we would like to uh, begin by the first question, which is if you can start by telling us how you started your career journey. Uh, thank you, Hiba. Um, sometimes we end up doing what we never really planned to do in the first place. So my career journey, I'm, I grew up in Bahrain. I'm Bahraini of Palestinian origin and uh, I went to study in the United States. And when I was studying in the United States, I was uh, keen on studying law. So I finished my university, I came back to Bahrain, and I uh, said that I was going to just practice law. And then um, I had a, a, a job as a, an intern in a bank. And it's funny how a, just a small detour can become your whole life journey. So it was then that I really liked the energy of banking. And that's when I ended up uh, choosing banking as a career. And I worked as a banker for over 30 years. I moved to Switzerland and I have uh, had about a 30 years plus career in, in banking. But at, at some, somewhere in the depths of my soul, I always was very passionate about the cause of, of Arab women. And uh, three, four years ago, while I was still working, I set up a, a, profit, a non-profit association, Challenge to Change, and I registered it in Switzerland. And um, then it, it, it just, I was still wearing two hats. And at, at some point I just said, I, I prefer to do what I love. And that's when I basically said goodbye um, to a 30 year banking career and now i've been focusing on arab women empowerment so that that's in a nutshell my, my career so taking you back to your banking years um and i know that you spent 25 30 years in banking what are some of the challenges that you faced 
uh, during your career, you as a woman, um, perhaps working in the banking sector, which is predominantly male, uh, uh, you know, um, dominant uh, field. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you face and maybe how did you overcome them? Um, my, my first challenge was when I just started um, as a banker. And in, in my most of my challenges have been relating really to the fact that I'm, I'm a woman. So the first challenge was the fact that I started uh, out as a private banker. And as a private banker, you're really dealing with people's most, I mean, their, their wealth there. And, you know, they, they need to trust you to give you their wealth. So the challenge was, the balance was, how do I get these men's trust? Because it was often men to trust me with all their life savings and investments, uh, but at the same time, not be overbearing uh, so that you know you, you still don't deprive them of their sense of manhood. So it was a balance between not being too much of, you know, too, too, too submissive or, or I'm, I'm trying to use the word, it's a politically not too much of a woman, but that's the wrong word to use. So I had to find a thin balance between trying to gain my trust, uh, their trust, and, and at the same time, um, not, not be overly bearing. Uh, so that was, that was my main challenge. And it was, they were difficult years in the beginning because I would be traveling to Qatar and the UAE and they were many years ago. So it wasn't the same. It wasn't as open as it was now. So that was the challenge. How do I earn my respect as a banker and as a woman at times where, you know, I, I think there were many, you know, just a handful of us. Um, so that was the first challenge. And the second challenge was later on when I, I became a mother and I had to balance between life and work and I'm, I'm, I'm a dedicated mother and I'm a very hardworking employee. So how did, how, you know, balancing the two was also a very thin line that I, thin balance that I had to, to, to establish. You touched upon two questions that I was going to get through, but going back to the first one, um, proving yourself as a woman in that field, what are some of the things or techniques or tools that you have used or that you've learned um, that helped you, you know, establish your position as a banker in private banking and travel, you know, across regions and earn trust? What are some of the things that helped you gain that trust and and maintain your position in banking for long years. The what really helped me is is to know my strengths as a as a woman. And many of us, or many of us, sort of feel that they have to shed their femininity and womanhood to be successful. So yeah. it was to really learn my strength as a woman. And women are compassionate, they are team players, they're hardworking, and, and they establish a connection. So what I, what I did was, to, to realizing that strength as a woman, it gave me an advantage because when I would meet the male clients, often being a woman, I would also be invited to their homes. So here I get to know the wife, the children, and the ice is already broken and I already have one advantage over my male colleagues because they were never invited to the homes. So that yeah. immediately puts me at, at an advantage. So being a woman and, and leveraging on that. And the second I would say is that you, this is a job and we are in a, a time where Respect is the most important thing. So you've got to command respect. You've got to teach people how to respect you. So I would say respect is a very important uh, element too. And to to respect, you have to be respectful of, of uh, your job, your background, your gender. So I think commanding respect and expecting respect in, to, in return was, was something that always somehow put me uh, above others and, and and the last one actually is and it goes for everything is to try and have or to have a, a very high moral compass right um you stayed for a long time in the banking career what kept you going in the banking career and not thinking about perhaps changing or moving into something else i know that you founded um challenge to change was that something at the back of your mind and you were planning um, you know, of establishing challenge to change, 
or was it something that came as a spur of a moment? Um, we're going to go back to the aspect of how did you found Challenge to Change, but I want to want to understand more um, what kept you in the banking sector for 25, 35 years? Do you think that if somebody gets into an industry, it's hard to shift or change? Or was it something that you're passionate about? Or what kept you in the banking industry for, for long, long years? What, what kept me going is, is one, the, the sense of achievement and fulfillment. And uh, this you know, manifested on, on two, in two areas. One, I'm, I'm very much a people person and a networker. So it was, it was a real challenge for me to build relationships, especially difficult relationships with clients, to gain their trust, to become a trusted advisor. So that for me was a challenge and it was work in progress and at every level of, of uh, success or of gaining that trust and building that relationship was one which gave me tremendous sense of satisfaction. So, so that was one. And the, and the second was, you know, being a, a, a single woman and an Arab in the West and in the banking industry. I mean, the banking industry, as you rightly said, is very much a male uh, dominated industry. And, and for me, it was the sense of challenge. It was like, I want to show or not show them or to show myself or basically just it was that sense of challenge that I wanted to, to achieve. I wanted to you know, to to you know, to have a a single mom in the banking industry of Arab origin achieve successes that you know her male counterparts may have or may you know may have not even yet achieved. So that the sense of personal satisfaction in a difficult situation was really the second one. Now, when it ceased to be exciting, or the, the, you know the the whole it evolved and banking changed is when I lost my passion. And you know, I, when I lost my passion and I began to just feel that it was very much like this is when I decided that I, I need to move on to something more fulfilling. So can we say that uh, if somebody loses their passion towards their job, it's time for them to make a change and to shift? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, Dina, within your journey, um, and I'm quite sure that you've come across female leaders, why do you think we have less female leaders at the top? I think it simply boils down to the fact that deep down, women lack that, that confidence in themselves that they can do it. Um, you know, so I think m many women, there, there are two. I, again, I the answer is twofold. So one is that sometimes they lack that confidence that, they can achieve the same thing as men. So many times, you know, we would be in meetings and, and for example, you know, the, the woman would be sitting there saying, maybe I should raise my hand. No, that's a stupid question. So she lowers her hand. Whereas the male counterpart is just saying something, whether it's relevant or not. So it's that sense of confidence. And again, that comes from upbringing and our social, the social fabric where we come from. Um, so, so really, that's that's. Um, I, I would say that that's um, that's it. Um, it comes from that place. Did you ever receive mentoring while on the job? Did you have a mentor that helped you throughout your journey, whether it's through the alumni platform of a certain university or whether it's through your contacts or someone who's more senior uh, that was your mentor and helped you throughout your journey? Or do you believe in mentoring? Actually, I wish I had mentors, uh, but it wasn't something that was, you know, like um, thought. I mean, it wasn't something that was available or was popular or available um, the time that I was I was working, let's say, 10 or 20 years ago. Mentoring yeah. has become, I guess, more recent. So definitely, I think m my experience was really like, learning from the job, trial, error, mistakes, experiences, and, and having, you know, learning from one's mistakes and, and having good support. But definitely, um, I, I think, you know, as I, I, I mentor now, I see the strengths, and, uh, you know, the strengths that mentoring can give and, and how a mentor can just help you see, you know, it, it's not about a mentor telling you, you, you know, what to do, but it's actually leading you to find that knowledge within you so that you can find your own way. Absolutely, I mean, mentors, um, 
is something that I, I believe every person should have. And um, throughout our platform, our Manchester network, we have mentoring platform. And this is something that uh, is readily available for any student and alumni that we wish they would really reach out and find a mentor to help them throughout their journey. Um, talking about work-life balance, and I know that it's somehow, especially for women, it's hard to achieve that work-life balance when they're trying really to fulfill their professional aspirations and to focus on their professional success. How do you think that we women or people in general, anyone, um, uh, should be able to fo should focus on work-life balance? What should we do in order to allow ourselves to have that kind of flexibility between work-life, home life and, and create that sort of balance? And was it, um, did, you, did you have that sort of work-life balance uh, in your mm, life? Very much so. I mean, you really touched on probably the core issue that makes uh, many women, especially young women in university or young, young uh, women who are just entering the workforce, very apprehensive about taking on a job because they they feel that you know they can take on a job if they're married but then the big big hurdle is that what am i going to do when i have children and 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 many women have that huge apprehension on how, how can i make how can i be a mother and 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 uh, be able to work at the same time so my answer to them i used to mentor young young girls when I was at Deutsche Bank, uh, young women who had just entered into the, the job and, and that was their, again, their biggest fear. And what I would say is that when you are diligent and hardworking, you, you are a better mother and a better employee. So things fall into place. The most important thing is not to feel, to have a sense of guilt. Because most women, myself included, you know, when I, when I was pregnant and I would uh, need to tell my boss, I, I'd rehearse how to tell him for a month before I told him, as I was feeling guilty and oh my God, and you you take it as a as a, as something negative and as an you you're, you're apologizing for it, uh, whereas. Men, I remember in Switzerland, would, would go to the army, and of course, they disappear for six weeks, but that's okay, that's the army. So women have to have more confidence in the fact that, you know, when we get married, when we choose to have children, this is, we are contributing to society. This is society's most important role. And as such, we should approach it with confidence. And, and work-life balance, the most important thing is actually, if you appreciate your, if you set your priorities right, and if you are um, a, a mother and your family, you, you give your family, your children priority, that means your values are in the right place. And frankly, if, if I was to look at two, two employees and one doesn't you know, take care of her children and sits at home in the office all day and the other one goes and is a good mother, I would frankly prefer the one who, who has her, her, her values and her priorities right. Um, so I think we should just approach it with confidence and things do fall into place. Uh, and today the market and the, the workplaces have become a lot more accommodating of, of mothers than I think when Previous, I was when I started yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> absolutely and I think also uh this year has showed us showed everyone across the globe that uh women and and us all of us really in general we can uh with flexibility and with understanding we can create that work-life balance and we can do our work anywhere anytime and, and no, no matter you know what tools we use, whether in person, face to face, or flexibility, um, it's just that understanding that how can we you know be productive and and how, and where to do it and and just you know be able to facilitate that and create uh, that work life balance is is key. I think this is one of the main lessons that we learned this year. Um, talking about flexibility. Um, do you think that uh, that's an option that women should have, or not women, I don't want to focus on women, but I want to focus on um, all working people or working professionals. Um, we noted that this year flexibility was really very high since the start of the, of the year. Is flexibility something that was given to you during your banking career, and how do you 
um, do you think that it's really important um, to perhaps shift the way we do business uh, with the change of times, perhaps when not doing a nine to five job and um, um, incorporating more flexi time and flexi work? Is this something that would contribute uh, to the um, perhaps increased performance of uh, individuals or professionals? Um, I think, again, um, when I started working and throughout most of my career, uh, flexibility in terms of time was not really um, something. It was like nine to five and, you know, there were banks where, you know, you would go in at eight and, and people would be like looking at the watch because they're all there from seven. And if you leave at seven, they're all there and you're feeling guilty for leaving. So I think, first of all, it, it 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 really boils down to you achieving your objectives and if your superiors see that you are hard working and that you're delivering the objectives at, at the end of the year then they are a bit more flexible when it comes to flexibility and i i remember when i had young children i would take a blank piece of paper and i'd, I'd show my boss and i'd say what are my objectives this year and uh, he, you know, please write them down. And and I would say, now you put down my objectives. How I do it is my way. I, if I don't deliver at the end of, of the year, then come back and talk to me. So I, you know, imposed some form of flexibility because I delivered the goods. Now yeah. you've mentioned rightly that this year has been a complete game changer. And whether we like it or not, I think wor workplaces and people have have. Um, realized that even when the COVID disappears, I think we've learned many lessons. And, you know, uh, f first of all, companies will probably have much less, you know, a, a smaller work workspace because they're like, they don't see the merit of everyone having an office with photographs and a plant, you know. And uh, <clears throat> what they will establish is probably rotation where the, the costs are high, so they don't need to pay for office space. So that would inc automatically uh, make for more flexibility because some people will be working from home and rotating. Travel will be affected because they see that we can do things like this on, on, on video versus traveling across the globe to meet someone. So this year has been a game changer. And I, I think people are seeing the merits of, of, um, of, of um, working remotely and still being able to, to deliver. Now, deliver. it's very important to also make sure that you are disciplined and you to a structure during the day. But I think definitely we are heading towards more flexibility and it's important for both men and women to have that flexibility. Absolutely. I just wanna remind the audience that if you have any questions to Dina, you can type them in the question box section and uh, we will be going through them throughout uh, the session. Um, now we have a question before I move on to the rest of, uh, of the questions that I have set for you. We have a question from Neha, she's asking, how did you manage stress and time during the change of your career? I think we touched uh, upon that, uh, managing stress and time during your career. Um, well, you... Perhaps we can... Go ahead, sorry. Perhaps we can talk about how did you cope with stress in general during your working time? Um, stress is something that is one of the, the major, uh, you know, uh, indicators that most professionals suffer from these days. And, and, and the outcomes of it, not knowing how to handle stress and how to manage stress would lead to burnout. Um, so what are some of the strategies that you have used perhaps to manage stress during you know, uh, your banking the, the, career? I would, I would tell the youngsters that somehow I learned the hard way because I come from a generation where, you know, things were different when, you know, people in banking, it was, it was when someone told you that I, I work, I don't take lunch and I work on weekends and I, it was like a way of, of boasting that I'm a hard worker and they had it wrong. So did I manage stress when I had young kids and I was running and juggling all of these balls in the air? I don't think I managed it well. But what I could, uh, and, and as a result, I, 
I became extremely stressed and it affected my stress levels and my um, my emotional state. And you spoke about burnout, but what yeah. I could definitely, so somehow we learned, um, you know, if I were to advise the young kids today, I would say that it is so important to manage stress uh, before taking on anything. I think this is something our generation didn't really it wasn't just the focus we weren't focusing on it but it is so important to manage stress because it's like a car running on empty in the middle of the highway you know it's as simple as that so unless you manage your own stress levels unless you take time off for yourself you you um take days where you do nothing and you you know you exercise and you meditate and and you do what you enjoy and you take time off then you know, you're actually thinking of the others and, and your family and your workplace when you take care of yourself. It's as, it's as simple as that. And like you said, taking care of the mental and physical well-being is really important because the mind and body are connected and that's really important. So uh, just out of curiosity, if you were to go back uh, in time, how would you do things differently? if i would take on i would stop i think um I, I would not be so like like a hamster in a wheel just trying to achieve 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 um thinking that this was just you know um that that was the 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 end end result i i would have probably taken more time to relax i would have felt that it was okay to 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 just like not think work on the weekends or in the evenings. Um, so definitely, and I would have um, actually one piece of advice I would say is I would have um, learned how to say no more often because sometimes we just don't want to say no because we just think, no, 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 I'm up to it and I can do it. And then we just put more stress on ourselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so what really triggered you to think about starting Challenge to Change? And at what stage in your career did you think about Challenge to Change? And uh, how did you start your journey with it? Um, I've always been an advocate of uh, women in the Arab world and, and the dichotomy they have between their aspirations and their hopes and then some of the limitations they have in their families, in society, uh, in the workforce. So I've, I've always been very, uh, very much, very passionate about that and, and about the contradictions that sometimes we, we face, which then force us to not achieve our full potential. So it, it really happened um, when there were two, two folds. The, the, you know, the shift took place over, you know, two different phases. The, the first phase is when I personally, you spoke about burnout, that I had reached a, a level where I was, you know, I was in a very difficult moment in, in my life and uh, emotionally, psychologically, I think the stress just piled up completely. And, and at that time, I was in such a moment of, of despair. And when you're like that, when you're going through these emotional and psychological issues, you, you feel ashamed, you feel alone, you just... Um, you just suffer on your own. And, what, and you suffer uh, silently, perhaps. And you suffer very silently. You suffer silently and you're not only, you, uh, you're, you know, other people, you're misunderstood by people and, and you're ashamed yourself for feeling the way you are because you're saying, I don't have a problem. I have a, I'm living in a great city. I have everything. Why am I feeling this way? So uh, not knowing that actually mental illness is, is an, an illness. It is today in, according to the World Health Organization, the third most debilitating disease after cancer and cardiovascular diseases. So Absolutely. this is extremely important. So, so I think during that time, I was lucky um, to ask for help and, and to come out the other end. And, and I, I felt then that I was lucky to have made it from the other end and that there's so many people out there that have felt the way I have felt and that have suffered alone in silence. And I wanted to establish Challenge to Change because I wanted to create a community for Arab women to tell them that you, you, you're not alone. You are, there's a lot of people, you have a community now, you can ask for support and you can embrace that vulnerability and then find out that there's 
you're actually one of millions who's gone gone through that challenge. So that's really was num number one. And then, uh, so I, I set up Challenge to Change, but then what made me leave banking was I was wearing two hats and I was working on Challenge to Change and at the same time I was working on um, in the banking. So, and, and uh, I was having lunch with a good friend and, you know, banking had evolved, it had changed and I'd lost the passion completely. And he told me, he said, you know, you're dragging your feet to go to the office and you're spending 90% of the time doing something you hate and 10% doing what you love, which is challenge to change and, and impacting people. So I really went home and I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, he's right. So two, three days later, I went into my boss's office. I handed my resignation and I said goodbye to a 35 year career and a very well paying job. But I've never been more fulfilled. That's fantastic. I mean, as just, I think it's safe to say that once you lose your passion in whatever you're doing, it's just not rewarding anymore. And I think it's time to find change. And well, you exactly. find you found challenge to change, but exactly. for the rest of the people, they need to find that change in their career. Uh, yeah. And I, I think also you touched upon a topic which is. Um, you started with stress and stress built out into so many things, ended with burnout. And that's what most of us uh, professionals don't realize that the beginning is stress. So you don't want to end up in a place where um, it's just going to affect, you know, your mental well, uh, mental health, well-being, uh, and it's going to affect not only your work, your personal life, your professional life uh, in general. So. Um, Talking about mental health, how important do you think the subject? First, uh, we, we understand that now it's getting a bit of awareness uh, and, and people are trying to read more and learn more about mental um, health well-being. How important is that topic? And do you think that uh, is it out there for people? Do they still understand the importance of mental well-being? And uh, is it given that, uh, you, you know, do corporates or banking sector from your experience do, how do they approach mental health and, and mental well-being in general um first of all i think mental health and mental wellness is the core and the backbone of each and every one of us so when you look at education and vocational training i think that it's always good to teach and to train people but as far as I'm concerned, mental health, uh, your mental health and your mental well-being is the spinal cord. So if the spinal cord isn't strong, the education that you are giving is just strengthening the limbs, but the, 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 the spinal cord is weak. So for example, you have someone who's got a PhD, but then she, she's suffering from deep-seated anxiety and low self-esteem. That degree is not gonna take her far because of the deep-seated issues. So I think mental health is primordial. It is the core of any of any person. And it's it, it's our duty as, as people, as parents, as educators, as people in the workplace to identify and give importance to mental mental health. Um, I mean basically mental health has a huge stigma. I mean, there's a lot of stigma on mental health. So but with regard to, you know, as, as I mentioned, it's, 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 a, it's established as an illness, but because it's invisible, you know, I mean, if, if uh, somebody's got cholesterol, then they take medicine, that's no problem. If somebody breaks a leg, it's visible and you help them cross the street and, you know, you carry their shopping for them. But when people have mental illness, they 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 suffer from anxiety, they suffer from severe depression. But you know what happens is that our people around them don't understand, and then it's like, what's your problem? Uh, get up, go and exercise, pray, open the window, go to the gym. But that doesn't help, and that's that's you know the what it it just actually makes things worse because the person who's suffering can't even get out of bed because it's it's a you know it's it's a very acute position it's an illness, uh, it's an illness. so I, I i think it is very important and actually mental illness 
costs work workplaces and companies a lot because those people who suffer from it are uh, if it goes undetected the 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 um the mistakes they can make or or just the price the company pays is is can be huge um i mean i can give an example uh, it's known but a few years ago there was a very famous incident of uh, an, an airline called the german wings and um, the pilot was suffering from severe depression but he was ashamed to mention it to his employer and the doctor of course banking doctor secrecy so he was suffering and he, he took off in a plane and crashed the plane in a mountain with everybody in it and it was clearly and that was a huge wake-up call because if he was less ashamed of it if he thought that he could not lose his job because he said i'm suffering from depression if the doctor felt that he could tell the company then you wouldn't have had the situation uh, that you had you know an extreme and dramatic example but there's examples like this that affect families every day that's true and i think we should speak more about it uh, corporates uh, to our colleagues uh, to uh, to all the people around us the importance of uh, mental well-being and um if you suffer from any you know any of the symptoms sleeplessness anxiety uh, irritation just don't suffer silently. Just talk, talk to people around you. Talk to us if you are, you know, within the university. Seek help. Um, just don't be alone. Um, what are some of the messages that you're trying to tell, uh, you know, the people through Challenge to Change? And I'm sure that you have some sort of messages. What are the messages that you're giving out there uh, to these women and women, particularly who are uh, considering going into the workforce? I, I would uh, basically uh, tell these these women that you cannot change what's around you until you change yourself. And I really believe in the quotation by Mahatma Gandhi, who says, uh, you know, be the change you want to see in your life. And that's partly where the name comes from, you know, challenge to change, because uh, it's be the change. So I, I would I would tell, the, you know, these women is that you, you have to... Uh, first of all if you want to change your circumstances change yourself and work on yourself and accept your circumstances and sometimes accepting your circumstances means accepting your your own vulnerability yeah. because we're ashamed of accepting our vulnerability so the message would would be that accept yourself accept your circumstances and work from within to change so i mean and i believe that uh, women specifically when you when you do that then you become a better person in general and then you become a better member of society or a better mother and then it it produces a more progressive society a more educated a more cultured society and you become the role model to your sisters and brothers and later to your children so it's it's really a ripple effect and it really starts very simply by you changing you know yourself to change your circumstances and accepting your circumstances and then accepting being authentic and true to yourself i think this it's safe to say that this applies uh to women as well as well as men equally uh change is something that is intrinsic uh, and it should happen to each one of us but i mean taking that step and uh just you know crossing the border of fear is what we really need to uh, you know focus on when we're trying to make that change um so what is your top advice to anyone um starting a career or wishing to change their career what is your top advice i i would really say do what you love do what you're passionate about don't feel that you have to go into a certain field because somebody else wants you to and then find out about that field i mean if, if you want to be an engineer or if you want to be a pilot you know find out research it don't go in with romantic ideas about oh i want to be a pilot when just research it research the the pros research the cons but most importantly um love what you what you do 
and then find out about it because knowledge is power when you know then you're you'll take a, an enlightened uh, and an informed decision so that would be very very what i would say absolutely true uh, i mean that's the top advice i would also give uh for anyone who is changing a career i would say follow your passion and then before jumping into any different industry, do your informational interviews, learn more about the sectors that you would like to go and know yourself. I mean, know what you're passionate about, what you care about, because if you're in a career that you want to move into, change career into something that you, you know, you're passionate about, this is where you're going to stay longer, where you're going to thrive, where you're going to feel happy and feel in a happy place. Because eventually what you, you don't want to do is be in somewhere where you're spending eight to nine, eight or ten hours a day doing something that you don't enjoy and ending up, just like you said, feeling burnt out and then, you know, 90 percent unsatisfied. Yeah. But then, Dina, it led to something which is really good. It, it yes. made you think yeah. about challenge to change. So sometimes Absolutely. perhaps, <laughs> I mean, you know, get yeah, stuck awesome. somewhere. The philosopher Rumi says the wound is the place where the light shines in. So sometimes it's our deep, darkest moments, it's our most difficult challenges that are our largest uh, opportunities for growth. Absolutely. So we should always focus on look for the opportunity, always look for the opportunity in a challenge. What are some of the skills that you think are really valuable these days, um, not only to employers, but in general, some of the top skills that you think every individual should learn if they don't have or should seek them? Um, number one, I would say communication skills, effective communication skills, because if we were to look at the conflicts between people today, they say that um, 10% is the real issue, and 90% is how that message was delivered. So if the message was de delivered in a, in a more effective manner, you might not have had the problem in the first place. So I would really, really say that it's important to take communication skills. Two, I, I would focus on what we, what we call soft skills, which is you know, skills like um, adaptability, flexibility, uh, to be able to, you know, today the world is changing at such speed um, that it, it's, you know, between 2000 and 2016, there was more change in the world than there was in the entire um, 20th century and the gap gets shorter. So what's happening is that sometimes, you know, youngsters go into university and graduate to a different world. There's, they're saying that by the year, um, you know, in 10 years, probably 50% of jobs as we know them today will be obsolete. So it's, it, it's even more important to learn soft skills, flexibility, adaptability, how to adapt to change, emotional intelligence. So all of these is, is extremely important. To learn just an academic skill is great, but unless you can adapt to change and develop the emotional intelligence to, you know, and the flexibility, then it, it, it's the only route to, to be able to adapt to the, the, the fast moving, age of tomorrow absolutely and we we, uh, we have last, yeah sorry sorry and, go, and go last, ahead dina sorry and lastly i would say you really have to be true to yourself authentic to yourself and and not uh, to feel like you always have to put a front of strength when you're not strong on the inside and actually there is no weakness in your vulnerability your vulnerability is your biggest badge of courage i've learned that the hard way so yeah so that's that's what i Thanks, would say Dina. these are words of wisdom actually and um i want to stress on the point of the skills um you know we tell our students once they join our programs that um, whether it's the mba or the other msc's programs they're going to equip you with the knowledge and with the skills they're going to give you all the tools that you need to become successful but we will also work with you on the softer side we will also work, we'll give you uh, the soft skills, we'll give you all these webinars that is related to emotional intelligence, time management, stress management, personal brand, 
Um, and I think we want to focus more nowadays. Uh, yes, uh, academic knowledge is very important and it's valuable for career success for, for anyone. But if you don't have these soft skills, how can you get your message out there? How can you communicate yourself? How can you build your brand and show it to the world, to show yourself, to show your knowledge, to show that you have an MBA or you have a master's or um, whatever. So these are really important. And being authentic, I mean, that's the best advice because it's quite often we find people trying to be someone else. Um, and especially if they're going to do an interview or they're going to meet someone at a business meeting, um, putting a different face or being someone who is not you is just going to get nowhere. Be authentic, be yourself. That's the best advice. I'm going to take um, take a look at the question section, see if we have um, any questions from the audience. Um, so we have a question. Could you please share tips for small business startups? So if someone wants to start a business and you've started Challenge to Change, what are the first steps that they should think about? Um, first of all, I would identify the the business. So I would identify the nature of the business. The business idea, yeah. Then the business idea. Then I would really do my homework and research to see is there, you know, is there a market for this this business? So I would do my homework and see the market. research the market. Is this something that the market will will observe, absorb, or or uh, accept, or you know, invest in? And then I would um, I would actually see who who the competition is. Who's the competition? You know, yeah. is is this, so you've identified the idea, you've researched if this market idea is valuable, uh, is good, it will add value to the company. And then who who's the competition? And once you know, as you've answered these three, and you still establish that it's a viable uh, option, then um, I think then you can put an action plan. It's important to put an action plan. So set your objectives, and I would I would set like a one year objective with a time time frame, a one year and a three year sort of goals or objectives, and and have stick to a timeline, and then keep reviewing it to see where am I uh, in terms of the timeline and that specific goal. So goals should not be static, but but uh, dynamic and they should be reviewed. And if something is not working, then it's definitely not a problem to say, okay, let's go back to the drawing board and let's do it differently. So that's what I would, uh, that's, you know, I mean, that's what I would recommend. What were some of the challenges that you faced when you know, you thought about your entrepreneurial idea and wanting to put it into place. What are some of the challenges? Um, actually, challenge to change. It's a bit different because we are a non-profit association. But it's it's the challenge was also a question of it's a non-profit, but it doesn't mean that we don't. So that you know, we don't need it's funding. Mm. So. It, the the biggest challenge was actually uh, to to try and have the people who will believe in your mission and believe in in your your um, cause to support you financially and otherwise. Absolutely. So that was the biggest challenge. And and the hardest challenge is when you're still small. It's 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 really ironic because it's the people who are small that needs the most help. But then you have to grow to a cer certain threshold so that bigger associations begin to invest with you so it's that the hardest part is the startup part and that's why you have to show real resilience and strength to 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 carry it forward and sometimes you know you have to really like have very strict spending measures until you cross that threshold and you begin to have outsiders invest with you was how how many years was it uh, until you felt that uh, challenge to change was really quite of established and past the challenges? Past that that key, I would say after three years. I, I would say years, in yeah. any, any I mean even in any startup, it's it's usually three years. One to three years, yes. So uh, your message here to anyone who's trying to perhaps who have an a startup idea is uh, to keep persisting. Uh, it takes one to three years in order to perhaps sort out the challenges and uh, perhaps afterwards think about scaling up. 
and taking the business I forward. Use, I would use one word and, and that's is persevere, persevere, persevere. And then persevere, persevere. So it's, it's there's nothing, there's no magic formula. You've got to persevere You've and got not to persevere. And, per, and and not lose sight of the, the, the objective. You know, keep keep the faith, you know, keep keep the faith. Stay the um, course. Stay the course. So uh, someone is asking, how did you come up with our idea? I think I think you mentioned that perhaps sometimes thinking about an idea and knowing is this a viable idea or not. Did you ever think that the business idea, did you discuss it with someone um, or you thought that you really believed in the business idea that you had or did you think that Actually, you discussed you know, they the didn't, topic? They didn't invent the term drawing board for no reason because it takes a long time to draw on the board before the board becomes even close to a, a diagram or a plan. So I actually didn't even, I mean, I started by, you know, I love to write. So I started by saying, okay, I'll write. And then about women. And then I started by having a blog. And then I said, wait a minute, why don't I try and share these writings and, and raise awareness so I created like a website and, and, and began to raise awareness about women and, and, and then it evolved. And then it evolved into an association and then we grew and we grew our programs and then I registered as an NGO. So definitely, you know, that's why I say when you, you have to continue to go back to the drawing board and revise your initial idea because your idea may not you know, a challenge to change today is not what I had on that, draw the first diagram I had on that board. It was completely it different, but I kept changing it uh, to, to adapt. And then I realized, you know, that no, this, this is what I wanted from the beginning, you know? Absolutely. Um, we have a question. Someone is asking, um, what is your advice for uh, students wanting to pursue a career in the banking? And do you think professional qualification, getting a professional qualification would help? Um, first of all, banking is a, is a big scope because within banking, you have different areas, you have investments, you have research, you have loans and credits and commercial. So banking is a, but what I would say in on a, to answer in a, in a, the bigger picture, um, I, I would say that um, it's 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 important first of all to to have the the, the confidence first of all I, again to identify the organization that you want to join and then have the confidence because you know today the the market has become a much more competitive place because today our kids are competing the world has become you know so virtual that you're competing with kids in china and india and the us and canada so it's not you know as easy for your generation so again the only thing i would say is that identify your goal and don't lose faith because if if in our generation we apply to 10 you've got to apply to 50 and um, and continue to work and, and essentially to work on your soft skills. And I can I can tell you, even at my time, you know, there were, you know, kids who graduated with an MBA from the States, but who moved to the Middle East and had zero cultural knowledge, zero history, zero, you know, and then you had people who studied English literature and moved into a bank. And the person with English literature was more personable. He, he had more human relations. He was culturally sensitive or she, and they were more successful. So I, I would say, make sure what I, what I would say, actually, this is, I'm finding the answers as I speak is I would say, be as well-rounded as possible. Um, take on, um, learn languages as much as you can, because today this is, this is a very strong, thing it's a very important element is to, to learn languages to have a wide scope of interests and not, not just restrict yourself to one area so i i would say just be well-rounded uh, whether it's in hobbies uh, interests languages travels this is what will interest because at the end of the day skills you will learn on the job but you can't have that sensitivity it's not something, it's something you develop and, and you, you grow. 
And if you're not a student, get an MBA from the University of Manchester. <laughs> get the knowledge. Get the knowledge that would help you to get into the banking sector. Um, Dina, thank you so much. This brings us to the end of the session. I, I know that the hour has passed by so quickly. Um, any last message that you would like to share with the audience? Um, I, it's just been a privilege. Uh, I wish I could see these kids face to face, the youngsters. Well, they're professionals. The uh, they're all working professionals, so. Uh, well, they, I, 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 I correct. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, it, it's it's been it's been. I, I would have loved to have seen them face to face. And the only advice again is just you know do what you love and be authentic. I can't emphasize that more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dina, for joining us today. Thank you for the insights and for sharing your journey with us, uh, uh, the top skills, advice, uh, everything. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you to our audience who uh, joined the session and stayed with us. And thanks for the questions that you asked. We look forward to seeing you uh, in our next session. So stay tuned to our events. Thank you all again. Good night, everyone. Good night, Dina. We'll hopefully, hopefully see you soon again. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.